Vinlos asks, I'm happy today to share a conversation I recently had with Tom Flanagan, the program director for news at WFSU, Tallahassee's public radio station. His is a voice nearly ubiquitous to locals, since when he's not broadcasting the news, he's likely out in public tracking down a lead. The self-described gossip has been in radio, both AM and FM talk, DJing, and newscasting from Maryland to Texas to Tallahassee for most of his life. In this episode, you'll hear him talk about his beginnings as an almost rock star, a chance meeting with astronaut John Glenn, and the importance of remembering that all news is local. Doing really, really well, and I really appreciate you taking the time to to do this with me. It means a lot. Oh, man, I, I could not believe you even asked me. I'm going, what in the name of God of any consequential interest could I relate to you, my God? You are a local hero. Are you kidding me? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kansas City star, that's what I are. There you go. Is that where you're originally from, Kansas City? No, huh? It's, uh, in fact, we can uh, get into that. It's an interesting little part of the world world that uh, not that many people uh, are from. It is sparsely populated. It is a, uh, a little known uh, gem up in literally um, hillbilly country. And I uh, do not mean that in the J.D. Vance uh, uh, way. He was from essentially uh, way down in West Virginia. But this is in Western Maryland, which people, you know, they think of Maryland, they think of Baltimore or Chesapeake Bay or something like that. Right. So, uh, you know, and that has nothing to do with that area. It is a totally different environment completely. And the, the county seat is the poorest city in Maryland. Oh, wow. Um, and so it is a, a former bastion of industrialization that uh, fell on very, very hard times back in the 70s and 80s and hollowed out almost completely. So it's uh, it's depressing. But my little hometown, 10 miles to the west, is uh, doing pretty well because it has FSU, Frostburg. Yeah. Gotcha. So. Gotcha. So how did you make your way down here to, to Tallahassee? I mean, I, I got a little bit of your of your bio from from the WFSU website, but it's, it seems like a circuitous journey that you've taken. Yeah, well, uh, that old radio nomad thing, you uh, start in a teeny tiny small town uh, for minimum wage and working maybe 80 hours a week, and uh, you aspire to the the big time, the major markets, the Atlanta's, Chicago's, my God, New York City, something that actually pays you money, because most radio uh, not only back when I got into it almost years ago, but uh, you would make more working at a convenience store. It might be a little more dangerous um, because uh, you, you never know when a customer may come in and not be willing to pay. Uh, but uh, it doesn't really uh, foot the bills. Let's put it that way. Sure. But you stuck with it? Yeah. It, well, it was fun. Um, we kind of backed into it. I never had great aspirations of, of getting into broadcast. Although when I was in high school, I did have a little transistor radio, which were very hip and happening back in the day. And you would uh, go to bed and have your little transistor under the pillow and you would pull in all of these massive uh, clear channel rock and roll stations from all over uh, your part of the world. So, uh, you know, there I am sitting in Western Maryland and I'm listening to WGAR Cleveland or WCFL Chicago, or every now and then uh, something would come in from uh, further south, like a WBT Charlotte. And you'd hear all these, you know, voices of God, which is what you had on the radio back then. You could not go on the air unless you had a beautifully modulated set of pipes, as we called it, or a <laughs> really good voice. And these these people just sounded so amazing. And uh, the whole ambiance, this theater of the mind thing in radio, you're thinking, you know, my gosh, these, you know, huge dynamic cities and these great personalities and this wonderful music that is just pouring out of this tiny two inch speaker. And it would transport you 
psychologically, emotionally to anywhere else in the world. And it was a really good for a kid growing up in a, a pretty depressed small town environment. It connected me to the rest of the world, it seemed. So I thought, gee, that I could never do that, but it's sure fun to listen to. And then I got into music in high school. And um, after our rock and roll band, right out of high school and into my years, I uh, decided to try to go uh, and become rich and famous. Uh, we relocated to New England for a while, which is where our uh, manager was, and started playing all these showcase clubs for different record companies one night or uh, the next to be A&M or Warner Brothers or whatever. And, um, so I'm going to pause you there just because we're not like we're not just talking a, a high school band like this, you you had a, a the the a budding career rock band going, yeah and uh, and you know tons of fun we uh, in the seventies the early seventies record companies were literally throwing money at new acts because they wanted the next big thing to be in their sign up list uh, so um, you know, we found a manager in. Uh, the Boston, Providence, Rhode Island area, and we started doing these clubs and meeting with record company people and tra- doing a, uh, yeah, a whole bunch of cover tunes, but we'd also sneak our own material in there too. But in order to do that, we're so talented, uh, would shift personnel. So the uh, organ player would come off and, for one song and grab a guitar while the guitarist would go over on bass and the bass player would go over on the organ. And <laughs> we needed something to keep the audience on the dance floor occupied acted while all this was going on on stage. I didn't play anything but drums in the context of the band. So I would stay back there and I came up with this crazy insane top 40 dj shtick that i would throw out there so at least the audience hey something's going on even though it made no sense whatsoever uh-huh. and one night we were in worcester massachusetts in the basement of a an abandoned department store where this club was located and during a break a guy came over and he said man i used to listen to you all the time when you were at wpro in providence and i said well hey thanks a lot but you know i've never been on the radio <laughs> man I, I was sure that was you <laughs> and that stuck with me and i thought boy if he doesn't work out be i got a fallback position mm-hmm. and indeed that's what happened the band ultimately broke up and got back to the hometown i thought well the local radio station's hiring maybe i could do that there and you so go. i just sort of backed into it there it, but it was there that's awesome so, drummer though, but but you you uh, when you were performing live, you would actually have a like a mic next to your to your kit in the back, and you would you would kind of announce your own band. Yeah, because uh, uh, we all sang. We were doing like five part harmonies mm-hmm. on the original we were performing, and uh, normally I would do like the low end. I do not have a great singing voice. I never pretended to, but I could uh, kind of get down in a lower register. So I'd be underneath the rest of the guys and they'd be soaring like uh, Eagles or uh, some other band. <laughs> there you go. Top of it. It sounded really neat. So uh, anyhow, that was what uh, uh, I did insofar as getting into radio. And then from, from that point, again, at the little hometown radio station, uh, uh, where I worked for about six years, aspired to go on to, uh, you know, bigger and hopefully better things. And um, the first place that said yes was, of all places, Tallahassee, Florida. So I wound up doing uh, commercial radio at a uh, AM station here in town, which at that time was an ultimate. We took news talk back in the mid 80s and uh, it was an interesting experiment. It had never really been tried in this market before. And we had like five reporters we could put on the street to cover city and county commission and school board and uh, hired the uh, the great Rick Flagg, and now retired to do our capital coverage for us. So he could concentrate on that and we could concentrate on the local. And uh, it was tons of fun until one morning I get a phone call from a guy who'd been cruising by on Interstate 10 and had uh, been listening to our morning newscast, I was doing the anchoring for that then. And uh, he identified himself as a headhunter for a chain of radio stations 
out in the uh, mid part of the country. And he said, I uh, have an opening at a uh, station in San Antonio, Texas. Would you be interested? And uh, I thought, well, that's kind of fun. Yeah, we'll see what happens. So they flew me out there. I interviewed, got uh, the news director's job there. And uh, that was an AM FM combo. The AM was 50,000 watts and threw a signal out over all of South Texas, all the way down into Mexico, which was insane. And the FM was adult contemporary, but had a very strong local news presence. So did that for about a year and a half until the station changed ownership. And they decided to cut back on news coverage because it was expensive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, I found uh, myself staring at the possibility of uh, uh, having another career move. Luckily, there was a TV station in Tallahassee, Florida that needed an assistant news director. And uh, they moved us back here and have been there ever since. That's a great, that's a great, you've, you've been around the country then and you've had, you've, you've, you've been able to, to get a sense of the different, uh, flavors of, of news that people like to hear or the, the type of stuff. And how does coverage vary? Do you think from region to region, uh, in your experience? Well, certainly in South Texas, uh, farm and ranch news is a biggie. Mm -hmm. We would have every weekday from noon until 1230 something called the midday journal and a large part of that after we got the obligatory hard news out of the way would be to get into what was going on with literally hog belly futures and things of that sort and bring on someone from the extension office to talk about the proper cultivation of yams or whatever the big crop was how do you deworm your cattle uh, <laughs> always a fun topic for sure um and that was uh, very popular out there um when i started in in western maryland of course being up in an arctic air corridor uh school closings were a very big deal in the winter time so mm -hmm. you would get a massive audience uh, mostly of uh, kids and parents trying to find out uh, whether or not the tykes would be heading into the classroom that day when the blizzard descended on the area and socked everybody in. Uh, and down here in Florida, um, very, very heavily environmental news uh, since we are surrounded by water on three sides. And that is a very, very big deal. Of course, we're underpinned by water as well. So uh, the status of uh, that water, be it uh, marine or fresh, is of vital importance in what's going on with algae blooms and uh, saltwater intrusion into the aquifer, those kinds of things. Very big deal here. Do you, uh, does the news department, do you, I mean, I, I assume obviously because of the internet, there's, there's some amount of interaction with the audience, but do you, do you field a lot of questions from, from the listeners about the topics that are going on or how, how does, how does, how does the interaction I happen? Do. My interaction has always been been street. Uh, in contrast to my colleagues at WFSU, whom I really envy to a large degree, they have far more in the way of formal journalistic education than do I. Um, my major uh, back at FSU, Crossburg State University, was art education of all things. And in fact, I did teach art in the Maryland public school system for a couple of years. Um, but I, there were no journalism programs up there unless you went to University of Maryland, and I certainly couldn't afford that. Uh, so when I got into radio and you're doing a disc jockey thing, but then you get off the air and you go to, say, an afternoon rotary meeting and because they have a good speaker and you interview that speaker and suddenly uh, the fire trucks go screaming by and you follow them and interview some people at the scene of the fire. It was all street level reporting, real, uh, if you want to use the old term, gumshoe stuff. You're out all the time and meeting with people and getting feedback and people come up to you and suggest story ideas and all that kind of thing. So I've continued that kind of um, approach to, to news, even here in Tallahassee. So I'm out a lot uh, and I talk to a 
a bunch of people. Uh, sometimes to the, the vast chagrin of my wife, we'll be out at Publix on a Sunday morning doing some grocery shopping. And suddenly there's a county commissioner who will come over and say, hey, you know, we heard you guys do a story on so-and-so, but did you know that coming up uh, during our next meeting, we're going to be jumping into, and, you know, it hasn't even come out on the agenda yet. And you go, whoa, uh, could I ask you about that? Because I always carry a digital recorder with me. And so they're, you know, amidst the rutabagas in the produce section, um, talking to a county commissioner about an upcoming agenda item <laughs> in their in their meeting thing. Um, and the same thing happens with just, you know, plain folks that I, I bump into. And so we we get that direct feedback, but now we're also trying to formalize that process. We uh, recently affiliated with a, a national initiative by the Pointer Institute, which is out of uh, St. Pete. It was an offshoot from the old uh, St. Pete Times, the Pointer folks who own the Times, of course. And they provide all kinds of seminars and workshops and things to help you with your your journalistic uh, development as an organization. And we're doing something now where we will formalize some of those connections to our audience to attempt to discover, okay, as journalists, we, we sort of know what's important, but what is really important to you guys that we may be missing? Not that we're going to pander Oh, you want to hear more about car wrecks? Oh, well, we'll go out and do more on car wrecks. No, it, it's not going to be that. But as far as issue-oriented kind of journalism is, is concerned, and I think that will open up those communication uh, chains a lot more uh, effectively than just this catch-as-catch-can thing that we, we have been doing. Yeah, and, and I imagine being in the capital here in Tallahassee, it, 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 is, it can be hard to strike that balance because you have to cover – statewide news, regional news, but then, you know, to use the old cliche, all news is local. So you want to keep it also personal to your audience. I mean, that's, that's got to be a difficult thing to manage. And, and what is some of the process of how you curate and decide which stories to cover? Yeah, that is, that's a really, really great question, Paco, because we agonize <laughs> on that question. Literally every day we do have and now via Zoom, of course, uh, what isn't? But every morning uh, on weekdays, we will have our get together where we all compare notes and say, OK, who's working on what? And what did you see that broke overnight that we may need to follow up on? And in, in state government news, we have made a more concerted effort to try to be local in that orientation also. So. Uh, if the legislature comes out with the budget, yeah, we can give you the big numbers and uh, what's going on in Miami-Dade and Broward and all, but really that's not of great consequence to our immediate audience. So we will look at Leon, Gadsden, Wakulla, the surrounding area that is our coverage part of the world and see what's what's going on there. Where We just found out a whole bunch of money is going out to uh, water and sewer projects in uh, just west of Tallahassee. And we're trying to figure out what's what's up with that, because as the uh, governor moved to essentially, you know, with the help of the legislature, do away with the Disney right. uh, scenario, the Reedy Creek Improvement District that's been around since 67 mm -hmm. and has essentially made Disney's 25,000 acres, Florida's 68th county. Right. Um, another one of those districts that was done away with is in Franklin County and provides sewer services to Carabelle of all things. Mm. And I, I don't think that's exactly a woke County, but Hey, they were caught up in the same deal. So, uh, you know, our, our portions of that money going to them to offset the potential loss of that jurisdiction. I don't know. We're going to find out. Because when the toilets flush in Carabelle, there better be something down there to carry away the stuff, um, or you have some major problems. Yeah, that's obviously. that's that's a that's a pretty quick way to an angry voter is uh, to have <laughs> toilets that are not working for sure. Yeah, and I imagine as you're covering these stories, uh, and you know, I, I don't want to get you too twisted up into some of these uh, questions of of, of of politics or anything like that, but. I imagine you get angry phone calls from the governor down the street or from the governor's office or, 
I mean, I know that, uh, I mean, I don't know how involved the university gets, gets into which stories you get, to, uh, get to cover or don't cover, but I mean, is, is there pressure that you feel from some of those elements here in town? That is a wonderful question. <laughs> and the answer is the university leaves us absolutely alone. Our license for WFSU public media, both on the radio and TV side, uh, is held by the Board of Trustees of Florida State University. So technically, you could have the board come down on us and say, we would prefer not to hear any stories about so and so, such and such. That has never occurred. Uh, we, and we do have full journalistic autonomy when it comes to deciding what we're going to cover and how we're going to cover it. The last time I heard any rumblings from anywhere in the FSU community was when Jameis Winston was the quarterback right. of the football team, and mm. there was some negative publicity that came out relative to uh, his behavior sure. in Tallahassee. And um, I think there were some folks maybe in the Golden Chiefs who complained to the powers that be at Westcott that, you know, well, you know, man, WFSU is doing an awful lot of stories about Jameis Winston's misbehavior, and I don't know if that's really appropriate. <laughs> and we heard about it uh, just through the back door, but no one came to us from the president's office or the uh, athletic director's office or anywhere else and said, could you guys pull back on that? So, uh, no, they totally uh, leave us alone and uh, permit us to make the, uh, the decisions about what is covered and how it's going to be covered. Every now and then we will hear from, um, say, the, uh, the someone in the legislature and say, well, we didn't like the tone of a particular <laughs> story to which we say, oh, gosh, well, we're sorry about that. But were there any errors of fact? Right. Exactly. In the story? And if they say, uh, no, there weren't, we'll say, well, you know, I don't know what to tell you about the tone. But uh, our deal is to make sure that everything we put out there is accurate. If we have erred, please tell us and we will issue a correction. We want to be accurate. And when you think about um, the culture of journalism, I mean, I'm, I, I consider myself lucky to have been raised listening to the radio uh, f as far as news goes and, and NPR my whole life. Like, you know, I grew up with, with Carl Castle as my, as my morning babysitter. Um, so I, I, it's ingrained in me, but what comes with that, at least as, from my understanding is there's a certain prestige that comes with being affiliated with, with NPR news and public radio. Is, the, the, is that a, is that a true thing? Like, is that something that you feel in the newsroom that there's a certain standard of quality and um, neutrality that that is important to reporting because I mean obviously we look at cable news we even look at um, certain regional news affiliates and you know that there's more of a corporate influence there so I mean how is the culture of of public radio any different from that? Uh, well sometimes I use the uh, the analog that we are part of NPR the same way the WCTV is part of CBS. Uh, we, are, we are happy to kind of be in that setting. You know, hey, we're the, we're the, the bright and shiny stone and NPR is the setting in which we exist. <laughs> We'd like to think of it that way, but actually they have a lot more programming on the air than, than we do on the local side. Uh, but it does have a certain cachet and it does raise the bar when it comes to such things as, as ethics and to uh, attempt to be um, as even handed as you can in the coverage of whatever it is you're jumping on. Sure, you are, are going to every now and then sit down with an individual and say, like you and I are right now, okay? Uh, but after this, you're not going to go uh, digging around to see, uh, you know, that uh, Flanagan character, he's pretty much, uh, you know, a whack job. Is there anyone I can find to say, uh, well, you know, he's, he, he's, he's really a goofball and you shouldn't listen to everything that he tells you. Um, you we try to do the same thing by giving vent to voices that maybe you might not otherwise hear. Um, and we don't necessarily then try to go out and find people to contradict those 
voices. But when it's an issue that we're covering, um, for instance, uh, this <laughs> just within the past 24 hours, this um, revelation from uh, the leak at the U.S. Supreme Court regarding the Roe v. Wade potential overthrow by the Supremes. Um, you know, we immediately go out and start talking to different people who have varying viewpoints on that. We're not just going to leverage the folks who are going, hey, this is the worst thing ever. And we're not going to concentrate on those who say, well, this is, you know, this will be a major improvement in the overall, I guess, morality or whatever of the United States. Uh, we really want to talk to everyone to find out what are, what are your thoughts on this? And what is your response going to be when and if this actually occurs? Um, so that is something that NPR certainly sets the tone for and that we do our very best to replicate is to have that same type of even handedness. And it's, it's not equivalence. You know, someone comes out and says, oh, the 2020 election was absolutely completely stolen. I, I think we have lots of folks who can uh, with a, a large degree of evidence, totally contradict that assertion. So we don't give that the same kind of equal treatment that we would in something like the abortion issue. But uh, I, we agonize over these things all the time. You, you'd love our news meetings in the morning because, you know, we, we get passionate, we, um, we stake out positions, we wait for someone to change our minds and and come up with a synthesis on, gee, how do we approach certain really sticky situations? And how can we present it in such a way that it's going to make sense and be of value to the audience we're trying to reach? Yeah, actually, I would love to, to watch that process. And then, you know, because what we always hear uh, uh, from, from the listener's end is the even-keeled journalistic voice. But I know that there's got to be some heated conversations behind those doors that go on and just deciding first what stories get covered and then how they get covered and who it, I, I would love to watch that actually. Sure. Yeah. And it's, it, it's not just the big issues either. I mean, we're, we're in, <laughs> as we call it, I, I'm sorry, it sounds so pejorative, but the silly season we're into the election thing. Mm -hmm. And at last count, there were like 27 candidates vying for city and County, I guess now 28 with D.D. Rasmussen dropping out of the school board. Wow. Yeah. 28. Uh, and we're going to have to talk to each and every one of those folks in a kind of open forum situation, uh, both be right after qualifying heading into the primary in August. And then again, the survivors of that process, uh, before the November election. So we'll be sitting down with them live and on the air and inviting phone calls and everything else and saying, guys, you know, if, if you are the incumbent, why should we keep you? And if you're the challenger, why should you get the gig instead and trying to figure out uh, how that goes? But we constantly get kind of uh, <laughs> not attacked, but uh, questioned by those folks, too. Well, you know, we you said something about this elected official the other day. You know, he's running for office and I do a much better job. Why didn't you talk to me? Well, you know, that person still has the job and they were acting in an official capacity. We, they don't cease to exist just because they're running for re-election. But at the same time, you can't continue to you know, have them on the air or online uh, talking about what they're gonna do to the exclusion of other people who are running for that job. So again, a balance you're looking for. All about balance. Tom, uh, would you mind strumming a little bit and give us a pull us out of tune? Oh, good Lord, yes. Speaking of tune, I don't even think I've tuned the thing yet. But <laughs> I'm glad you didn't ask me to play drums.
I, I part of my process is I really enjoy discussing with the people that I talked to about how how I how you came into my life and 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 those are usually strong memories and I remember I must have been 2006 right when you started on, on the radio at WFSU um, I had just started teaching in in that year in the starting in 2005 um, so that would have been my first year of teaching and, and I listening to NPR every morning, listening to WFSU, and your voice, it was a new voice, and you get used to hearing one voice on the news in the morning, and I just, your voice is very particular. And I, I've always been curious, um, both you and just radio uh, voices in general, how much of that have you shaped over time? And, and is is does do you think that the voice that we hear on the radio and this is something of a of a subjective question so answer it as you will but is the voice that we hear on the radio is that is that who you are an insightful question for sure because what i found paco over the years is that even those of us who have been in this accursed profession <laughs> for a long period of time are no better at determining the answer to that question when we hear someone than someone like yourself who is not in the business. Um, and I think the answer has morphed over the years, to tell you the truth. Back in the day, and by the day I mean starting, I wasn't alive then, the 20s and 30s and 40s, but hey, 50s and 60s and into the 70s, I sure was, back to that voice of God thing you had to have a certain type of voice and presentation to be considered for a radio job. If you had a high-pitched piping voice, if you didn't have good diction, if you not project well or create images with your fancy patter, you were not a good candidate for a broadcast gig, period, all right? Um, they wanted folks who sounded a certain way. And with the arrival of Top 40 Radio in the uh, 50s and 60s, they had people who sounded a lot like this. You wanted to really push hard and have a great presentation and a lot of excitement in your voice, and, uh, and which is phony as all get out. It really <laughs> is. Um, if people don't talk like that. And into the 70s then, with the arrival of album-oriented rock radio, at least in many of the larger cities, you had to ramp it way, way back. And we started off with uh, Crosby and Stills and Nash. And before that, it was uh, trampled underfoot, Led Zeppelin's latest era. <laughs> and, you know, you put people to sleep, for God's sake. You know, or you were supposed to sound, you know, totally stoned so you could relate to your audience who probably would be in the same kind of mental framework. Um, but that was phony as well. Today, we have really gotten in with podcasts and a lot of people having their own YouTube channels and other social media. Uh, what, kind of what you see in here is what, is what that person is. You have to have an authenticity because you can't fake people out indefinitely for sure, uh, particularly if they're looking at you at the same time you're talking. So the, uh, the golden age of the golden voices has pretty much gone away from uh, radio. And um, I, I must be, I guess, kind of authentic because I bump into people all the time who say, my God, you sound just the way here at, uh, at Publix as you do on the radio. So... Uh, I, I guess I am one unified personality, at least in that <laughs> regard. But it's it's not just the voice. It's also the persona. For sure. Uh, number one, I am very, very much by my own admission, as nosy as you can imagine. I like to find out what's going on, kind of have the inside track on the latest developments, whether it's at City Hall or at the Capitol or uh, what what business is going into that empty restaurant out on the parkway or I love that stuff but then I'm also a gossip and I want to share it uh, so I think those are two of the things you really need if you're going to be in journalism is to be both nosy and also uh, an inveterate gossip so you can bring it to the attention of the other people that you're 
uh, trying to reach uh, every day. But I also have, I think, a, a great deal of, of love for this community. And um, th that sure isn't fake. Uh, it is something that I, I've cultivated over the years because I know lots of people uh, I think that the vast majority of people are good people. Uh, yeah, there's evil in the world, and there are some folks who get up in the morning and say, who, who can I destroy today? But I don't think there's too many of them, at least not in the experience that I've had. I don't think that's very common. And so I, I love talking to folks in this town to find out what they're up to, what their aspirations and hopes are. And how they kind of see this whole thing playing out. We're going through a tough time right now, even on the local level. There's lots of division uh, that I have not seen before in this town since we moved here gee, more than 40 years ago. And that's a little distressing. And do we get beyond that at some point? Is that just a passing thing? Or is this tied to that much larger situation nationally where our default position is to be at each other's throats. That's very worrying. And um, I must hand it to you, um, a part of your whole rationale for what you're doing with this medium is to try to give people a better understanding of each other so that we withdraw the hands from the other's throat and go, oh my God, I didn't look at things that way. That's a good point. I got to think about that some more. So good on you, Paco. This is, I think, really needed in, in every aspect of our being to try to turn down the heat a little bit so we get to listen to each other a bit more. Thank you. And I, and, and, and I don't think that there's any question about how much you are committed and invested in this community. I can't tell you how many charity events or or art festivals or any of the numerous things that are going on in town that I've heard your voice. Even if I can't see you directly, you're, you're emceeing or you're making announcements and, and everybody in this town just appreciates what you're doing in terms of being a part of the community. So likewise, thank you for that. And and I guess to, to follow that up, I mean, do you do you view I mean you can't do something for as long as you've done it and and not sort of internalize some of that process in terms of you know a mission or a goal do you what is what is your philosophy on journalism it, what is the role of the newscaster in in maintaining that 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 healthy discourse between between people yeah being Maintaining the healthy discourse, but trying not to get into it so much yourself. Uh, and that has been another, it, th there's such a great temptation now. And we have seen it with the proliferation of cable TV news channels. Um, on all sides, as a former president would say, because we do see it as a role for many folks on TV now. And, and certainly talk radio, that I have a point of view. I am an apologist for this particular viewpoint, usually of a political nature, but it can be other things too, certainly. And then I will bring on my Greek chorus who will agree with me and reinforce my position so that I seem like I know more than possibly <laughs> I really do. Um, and oh my gosh, that is, it's intoxicating. It is addictive. I know a lot of folks who started in legit broadcast news who veered off into that, into that world um, where they are the pundits. They are the repository of all that is wise and all knowing and their opinion carries weight and clout. And I truly don't think that's our job. As journalists, yeah, you want to be a talk show host, you want to be a pundit or an, an influencer or an opinion leader or whatever you want to call yourself. Okay, fine. Have fun. Go for it. But you can't do that and do a good job at really covering your community because you're going to be talking to a lot of people whose outlooks will vary greatly from what you are thinking internally, but you really 
you don't want to get into a fight with them for crying out loud. You want to find out where they're coming from and uh, what their concerns are. Bring those to the attention of a larger audience, because probably there are other people in that audience who feel the same way that they do. And then find some other folks who say, yeah, you know, I can see that, but I kind of take it from a different angle. And here's where I'm coming from. And you keep those discussions like you do in your podcast. You keep those discussions moving and you don't jump in and say, well, I, I think you're totally wrong on that. And I'm going to contradict you for the next half hour. Or, you know, that isn't very productive, I don't think. Um, so we as, as journalists, again, have to be very circumspect about allowing our own opinions, because we all have them, from leaching into the overall discussion and saying, I'm going to top load all the people I, I talk with, with liberals or conservatives or fans of President Trump or um, people who like Joe Biden or whatever else, that there you're changing the rules of the game. You're, you're moving the goal line all over the place. And that, that isn't helpful. Again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess, I guess the, 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 the double-edged sword that, that continues to, to, to complicate things is of course, you know, the internet and it is such a, a source of, of free information in, in its, in its purest good form but it also can be such a fount of really bad, toxic stuff. And do you view that? I mean, I don't want to use the, the terminology of competition, but I mean, do you even engage with that challenge or do you just remain focused on doing the job? Well, we have to uh, look at all of these platforms as yet different frequencies of radio stations or different channels on the TV set or whatever else. Uh, it has become a primary source of information for, dare I say, the majority of Americans right now. You look at survey after survey. Where do you get your news? The Internet. <laughs> right. Well, sure, everything on the Internet is true. We know that instinctively. Um, but the way in which the Internet as an entity will select for us what we want to see and hear can be a concerning situation. Just the other day, I was in the market for a new watch. Something I buy maybe once every, I don't know, 20 years. <laughs> My last one was, was 1995 and it finally gave out. They don't make them like they used to. And so I was looking at a couple of websites and suppliers and shopping for features and price and all that thing. And that's all it took was like a 10 minute search. And for the next two weeks, every pop up ad was about watches mm -hmm. uh, because the helpful algorithm said, ah, you want to buy a watch. Let me help you. Let me show you more watches than you ever thought existed. And when you start surfing the web for news content, it does the same thing. <gasps> oh, you like this. Have some more. Have even more than that. And suddenly you're deluged with a lot of stuff that is very similar in viewpoint. And if you don't go farther afield to find other content, It'll just keep providing you with the same sort of stuff. And it's easy then to just fall into that bubble. And why get out? I mean, here it's coming to you all the time. Ooh, I didn't know this. Gee, hey, the uh, sun came up in the West in uh, Perth, uh, Australia today. That's interesting. How did that happen? And suddenly, um, if you don't choose wisely, young Padawan, you're going to find um, a lot of misinformation in that feed because the algorithm has decided you like that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It just keeps feeding you the things that you click on and uh, it's definitely programmed to, to, to get you coming back for more. That's for sure. That's, and I just, I, I appreciate the, the radio format because it is, it, it takes us back, I think to um, communication and it's, and it's one of, one of its best formats, which is, conversation you know there's no there's no 
flashing lights. There's no pop-up ads. You have to listen to the voice on the other side, and you have to engage with that with that person as a person to hear the story. And uh, and I think that that is just ab- that as a skill, as a listening skill, but also as a means of of acquiring information. That is that is an invaluable thing, especially when you have a voice that is trustworthy and has earned that trust over time. So I mean, I think that you. And and the the I've been here since two thousand and one, but I mean I've known you through the radio since you started, and and in all those years, uh, you've definitely earned that from me. So thank you for that. Well, thank you for the the kind thoughts and comments, uh, Paco. But this was drilled into me by my very first program director, back in that little one thousand watt AM radio station in my hometown, when I had just started, and uh, one afternoon i'm rocking and rolling we're going through the hits and i open the mic and i say hey all you guys out in crescent town how you doing today and as soon as i'm into the next record the, the program director the program director comes sauntering into the control room and he says don't ever ever let me hear you say that kind of thing again i said well gee oh, oh, i'm so sorry what, what 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 did i say that was wrong he said all you people you don't talk to all you people you talk to one person at a time and i'll thank you to keep that in mind we talk to the housewife as she's doing her dishes we talk to the guy that's driving down industrial boulevard and has you on his car radio you're talking to the kid who has you on his transistor as he's marching into school and that is who you're talking to one at a time whoa that was pretty heavy and uh, he's right uh you do that personal connection with that individual and that's all you gotta do it's a powerful lesson that's for sure and tom as as we wrap up here um if you don't mind and and please take your time to to answer these i want to ask you some uh some quick shot uh, rapid questions, just about some some standout moments, uh, just to hear some of your stories. Um, but as you think about all of the news stories that you've covered, all of the people that you've met, if, if we're going to talk about some standouts, if that's okay. Um, is there a particular interview with a person that you can remember as being mm, surprising or that you were just, you found yourself I mean, I don't know if you can be starstruck or flabbergasted or any of those adjectives, but what's an interview that stands out in your mind? This actually predates radio. So let, let me do that one first. Because okay. I do have one in mind for when I actually uh, got it. I, I was a kid. I was, this is like 19, oh God, talk about dating yourself. Uh, this is back in the early 60s. The uh, Mercury space program had just coalesced and they were looking at the very first people to go up in space and my father who had a little store in western maryland that sold school supplies and office supplies would periodically go to washington dc which was coming off of a time of great surplus (laughs) Uh, they cleaned out a lot of the big office buildings that the federal government had there and so they had all these old beautiful wooden mahogany office chairs and and tables and desks and all that kind of stuff. And my dad would go and uh, and purchase them uh, used for his store. And uh, he would take my mother and I along. That was a big trip back in the day. No interstate highways or anything. So it took a long time. But while he's shopping for furniture, mom would take me out to a department store or something. And at this one department store, she uh, we were in the book section she bought me a book and i was a nerd and it was about space and missiles and rockets and oh my god it was so cool and so uh we were meeting dad back at the store we took a cab there and i'm sitting at a desk (laughs) probably one that he purchased reading this book and suddenly uh dad comes over and says uh tommy there's someone i'd like you to meet and i look up and it's john glenn Oh, wow. His wife, Annie, they were shopping for office furniture because NASA had moved him to Langley, Virginia for final astronaut training, and he needed to equip a little home office. And again, this is one of the Mercury 7. He hasn't gone up in space yet. His mission is just a few months off. 
And he sat down with me and went through that book and explained, now here is the atlas that I'll be on, but mine is going to have these features that this one doesn't and all. And, you know, I'm just such a fanboy, uh, you know, totally speechless as he goes through all this. And then uh, later on sent me all kinds of brochures and information, probably top secret documents from NASA. I mean, it was great. What a gentleman, what a delightful person here. He's going to be a world famous hero. He sits down with this little kid and takes time to make him feel really special and almost treats him like a peer. So, you know, uh, Godspeed, John Glenn. That's Thank awesome. You, sir. That is awesome. But then, you know, uh, a, a radio story here, and it involves a guy who is already in public office, but back then he was just the, uh, uh, the principal at Leon High School. Rocky Hanna uh, had challenged his students at Leon uh, to raise money for cancer because breast cancer had taken its toll on a number of teachers at Leon. And he told the kids, look, you raise 5,000 bucks, I'll jump out of an airplane. They raised 7,500. Take that, Hannah. And it, he was stuck. He had to do it. And so one Saturday morning, a few weeks later, uh, there is the small airport up near, actually uh, between Thomasville Road and uh, Quincy off of 59. And uh, Rocky uh, got a quick tutorial on here's how you jump out of an airplane, a uh, double type of uh, skydive and uh, went up and all the students and parents are there and they're cheering and it was really a, a festive event for sure. And then we saw the little dots come out of that plane at 13,000 feet and there was dead silence. Will the chute open or will there be a big splat in the middle of the runway? where our uh, principal used to be. Anyway, uh, yeah, the shoot did open. He came down quivering like a, a leaf, but obviously exhilarated from the whole thing. And I just rolled the recorder for the whole thing. I barely had to say anything. It was just a little setup. Here's where we are and here's what's going on. But then I'll let the sound carry the story. And that was one of my favorites because it only took two and a half minutes to tell that story just using the sound from it that's great and, and that's still one of my favorite stories because i number one i didn't have to say a lot but number two it was such a vivid type of theater of the mind experience because you could hear the excitement and the voices and the oohs and the ahs of the crowd as the plane climbs up higher and higher and then the dead silence when you know is he going to make it or not <laughs> so that was fun i like that story are there any uh any any standout moments for you just that you I can't believe that I'm here or that I that that I'm covering this or that I'm in in this room while while we're hearing this? Yeah, uh, a one that uh, let's see it was a uh, a former Florida governor who now is uh, amazingly running for governor again. Uh I'm named Charlie Crist. Of course back then he was a Republican, not a Democrat. Um but I had heard through the journalist of Grapevine that a group of teachers was coming from South Florida to beg then Governor Christ uh, to put his signature on some bill promoting education, teacher raises, something. I can't really remember what it was, but I was sitting in the outer room of the governor's office on the plaza level waiting uh, to see these teachers. And I thought maybe, you know, before he brings them in to talk to them, I could get a quick comment or whatever from them. And uh, the teachers duly arrive, and usually, usually the typical uh, protocol is that the uh, governor's aide will come out and say, oh, you can come back to the office now, and then shoo them back in. But here, Charlie Crist himself stuck his nose out the door and said, oh, you guys are here. Great. Come on back. T Tom, you too. And then, what? <laughs> <laughs> this is pretty cool. Um, and uh, so I followed the teachers back in. Again, we're rolling uh, the digital recorder on the whole thing. And he uh, pledged at that point, yes, he was, going to, he was going to support this bill. Originally, he thought it was going to be a budget buster, but he had some ideas on how to properly 
correctly. And yes, teachers would get the raise there and they were very happy. And uh, yeah, I, I know, you know, you're, you're being used. I understand that. But it's sometimes nice to be on the inside to hear how this stuff actually goes down. And it was a little uh, a bit of a, a flattering thing for the governor to say, yeah, c- come on back. You can you can be a part of this, at least as far as hearing what's going on. Yeah, it was it was good political theater for him. But the teachers were happy. And uh, so I thought that was kind of neat. So I guess. What is it that you do? Like you've you're, you've been a journalist. You've been on the radio for for a while. Well, first is is this is this who you are? Do you think in terms of like your profession, um, or I mean, do you even think of it as a profession at this point? Is it, it, it? It's so hard to to think of ourselves and define ourselves. I know people ask me, you know, what's it like to be a teacher for almost twenty years? Is like, I don't know. I just go do I do I do what I do every day, and it doesn't really feel like a job. It's just it's just what I do. But, you know, wh- how do you how do you identify yourself or, or I don't even know what I'm trying to ask you, Tom. Help me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. <laughs> well, yeah, that is the ultimate question. And I think the ultimate answer is, you know, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life uh, because it doesn't feel like work. sure some days are better than others. Yeah, I don't want to do that paperwork, but I know I got to. <laughs> everybody goes through that but the the central kernel of your being is i get to get up and do this again today is that not awesome and having been one of those poor beleaguered souls who stepped away from what he loved for a number of years because i thought okay it's time to grow up <sighs> quit having fun let's just slog our way through and and be an adult um it was a delight to get back into into broadcast again and and into radio news because i had all these ideas that i'd been playing with when i stepped away from it god if i could only go back to it i would do this story or i would not make this mistake again because i think you learn a lot more from your mistakes than you do from your successes absolutely Um, But I rethought my whole career. So when I had an opportunity to reignite it again, it was just beyond awesome. It was great. And that was, oh, geez, what you said, 2006. Yeah. So we're (laughs) we're we're coming up on uh, on 20 years in three years. Right. Four years. Yeah, that's a that's pretty cool. Um, So. I appreciate it, I think, a lot more now than I would have if I had just gone on through from 1973 until almost 2023. Hmm. Yeah, we're we're in a time where uh, the zeitgeist right now is very much talking about multiverses. And I wonder if you ever think that there's a there's another there's another version of the universe out there where, where Tom Flanagan is still a drummer in a band. Oh, God, I hope not. That would be terrible because, uh, you know, I would have been supplanted by, uh, you know, uh, an 808 machine or, or something like that. There's an, not many real drummers uh, that are actually still performing today. One of my favorite YouTube channels is a guy in Atlanta named Rick Beato. He uh, is a phenomenal musician, a multi instrumentalist. He has produced all kinds of records and is very knowledgeable about uh, not just music, but the whole music business. And I follow his, uh, his YouTube channel religiously because he, he talks about a lot of how music has developed over the years from, again, the so-called golden era of the 1970s when we almost uh, got a record contract with Warner Brothers to today when so much of it is cut uh, programs like Pro Tools and, and all, which there's still some great music out there without question. But it's also real easy to do a cut and paste job. You come up with a couple of layered beats and, uh, you know, an auto tune uh, plug in and boom, you may have a hit record. Who knows? There's certainly enough of them that have happened. But it's also very much more difficult to make money in the business now. How many Spotify plays do you have to get? in order to even get a dollar today. 
I think it's it's what a quarter of a million. I, I mean, it's so, insane. Yeah, yeah. 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 He, he, just to make a living playing music now is next to impossible. And even in a town like Tallahassee, because I thought, boy, college town, there's got to be a million bars that have live bands in this town. <laughs> um, well, maybe you'll start. Maybe you'll get your own uh, your own YouTube channel going where you can. Uh... Uh, teach us some chords or maybe even get a, a little little drum drum beat going. Yeah, like and subscribe. Hey, look, I got my 14th subscriber today. <laughs> well, how long have you had it up? Uh, two years? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, thank you so much. Uh, and if you could uh, close us out, maybe play one of your favorite songs on the guitar and uh, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. Oh, let's see. What is a wonderful song here that we have? Mm. 